Hi there. Today we're looking at this news story from MIT Technology Review. Google's medical AI was super accurate in a lab. Real life was a different story. Uh, so the story here is that Google had this AI to detect diabetic retinopathy. So if you're a diabetic and you, your glucose isn't or your insulin isn't properly handled, that means you get damage to your blood vessels and the small blood vessels like the ones in the eyes here they're the first ones to get damaged and that can lead you to get this disease called retinopathy which are is in the retina in the back of the eye and that can lead you to go blind if it's not discovered soon enough so a eye doctor can look at a photograph like this and can determine whether you have it or not uh, I guess they would look at like a larger resolution of it. But in any case, they could determine from this. So Google built an AI that could maybe spot um, things here, that can maybe spot if you had this or not. And they tried to deploy this. And the story is about how this failed, basically. <laughs> so they said they had the, this in Thailand, they had the opportunity to deploy this. So Thailand's Ministry of Health had set an annual goal to screen 60% of the people with diabetes for this diabetic retinopathy. Um, it can cause blindness if not caught early. So here is where I comes in because uh, 4.5 million patients that have diabetes, there are only 200 experts that can determine from a photograph whether or not you do have that disease. Uh, so they say clinics are struggling to meet the target and Google has built a AI it says the AI developed by Google Health can identify signs of diabetic retinopathy from an eye scan with more than 90% accuracy which the team calls human specialist level and gives results in less than 10 minutes. All right, so this is pretty cool, right? They've developed an AI. You can send an eye scan and it'll say what, uh, what you, whether or not you have this disease. But then the problems mount. Um, they, so they followed over several months, they observed nurses conducting eye scans and interviewed them about their expertise using the new system. So the nurses who conduct the eye scans, they would try to use the AI and uh, they, they, the nurses themselves aren't specialists. They would otherwise send the scans to a specialist, but now the AI is supposed to handle this up. When it worked well, the AI did speed things up, so, but sometimes failed to give a result at all. So these AI had been trained on high quality scans, right? If, of course, if you want to train an AI system, you want the highest quality data you can get. But also in practice, you're not going to get high quality data. It was designed to reject images that fell below a certain threshold of quality. And they say often, often taking the photos in poor lighting conditions in the real world, more than a fifth of the images were rejected. So this is my take on it if you build something for the real world you need to take into account what the real world holds in store for you which means that you probably are going to have poor lighting conditions if you build an image recognition system right now i'm not saying that like some people are saying whenever you work with ai you should consider how it impacts later on and so on. no it's perfectly fine to work on a data set of high quality images if you do something like invent a new architecture or whatnot, work on optimization algorithms, like not, nothing of that. But it is, if you are thinking of deploying something in the real world, you need to take this into account. Now, I also think this was particularly poorly designed for the task, and here's why. Google probably here is mainly worried about legal culpability because the thing says it was designed to reject images that fell below a certain threshold of quality, right? The reason for this is that here you have a classifier, right? And either it says, it says, okay, here is positive and negative class. I am 
about this much sure of the positive class and this much sure of the negative class. And there's quite a big of a difference here, right? So I'm gonna go with the negative class. But if those two things are somewhat closer together, the Google doesn't trust its own AI. It's like, yeah. And if it did some decision here, if it says, well, I still go go with the negative class, right? This goes back to the patient and they made a mistake. Then this thing here is automatically responsible for that mistake. And since the AI is not a human, um, these mistakes here could be rather trivial mistakes that a human would have spotted. So basically, since it's deep learning, we don't really trust it. And then because Google doesn't want the legal culpability of being responsible, they simply reject these cases. They just say, we don't deal with it. We just deal with things with a large discrepancy. If you actually want to design something for the real world, you need to take into account, okay, there's poor lighting conditions. And I would think in, if I were to build something like this optimally, you would just output this thing. You would output this distribution. You would, in this case, you could say, look, I am 60-40%. I'm not sure I lean towards negative, but I don't think so. And then the nurse, who maybe also has some expertise, could be experienced in when the system fails or when it tends to be not sure and could kind of integrate that information. But this only works, so if you're a... That's maybe a recommendation for lawgivers. This only works if you don't make the AI system completely culpable for its mistakes. Um, it can output its estimation and it can, along of that, it can actually also output an estimation of its own uncertainty. It can like give you some confidence bounds here. Now these are not gonna be statistical true confidence bounds because it's deep learning, but still, I would say, please give all the available information that the system has and then let the humans work with the system rather than trying to fully replace the humans by simply saying yes, no, or reject. All right, so they say patients whose images were kicked out of the system were told they could have a visit, they would have to visit a specialist at another clinic on another day. If they found it hard to take time off work or did not have a car, this was obviously inconvenient, which I can understand. Nurses felt frustrated, especially when they believed the rejected scans showed no sign of disease and the follow-up appointments were unnecessary. This is exactly what I'm saying, right? The nurses often also have very good experience and can combine, could combine something like this with their own experience of when something is wrong and when something isn't wrong. And maybe you even build in some explainability to focus on part of the image. And then you could alleviate a lot of these problems. They sometimes waste the time trying to retake or edit an image uh, that the AI had rejected, right? Um, this, this is just, now you're just build AI working against humans rather than with humans. <laughs> Um, so further, it says, because the system had to upload images to the cloud for processing, poor internet connection in several clinics also caused delays. Uh, so patients like the instant results, but the internet is slow and the patients then complain. Uh, they've been waiting here since 6 a.m. and for the first two hours could only, we could only screen 10 patients. Yes, this is the type of stuff you have to take into account. Uh, so maybe actually put the GPU server into the clinic. It's better anyway for uh, for data privacy reasons. But of course, the large companies, they want to everything to be uploaded to their machines. Uh, it's more convenient for them. So th they say there is now working with medical staff to design new workflows. I mean, sometimes you do rely on an internet connection. So I don't want to be too too harsh here. Um, so the, the other, the, there are some critics here. So Michael Abramoff, an eye doctor and computer scientist at the University of Iowa hospitals and clinics has been developing an AI for diagnosing retinal disease for several years and is a CEO of a spin-off here. And he, um, basically says there is much more to healthcare than algorithms. And I mean, of course we can, we can all 
we can all see that. Uh, yeah, he basically says that the questions the usefulness of comparing AI tools with human specialists when it comes to accuracy. Of course, we don't want an AI to make a bad call, but human doctors disagree all the time, he says. That's fine. An AI system needs to fit into a process where sources of uncertainty are discussed rather than simply rejected. And this, exact, this exactly feeds into what I've been saying. If the AI were just to output the source of uncertainty and all it thinks about a particular situation, then the humans could discuss it right um, and then we could get to a better outcome but this only works if the legal framework is given right if you regulate and i get i get that point too you want to assign kind of blame when something goes wrong but you just have to know that this is what keeps these systems back often finally they say the benefits could be huge um there was one nurse that screened 1,000 patients on her own. I don't know in what time that is. I guess that's over the course of the study or so. And with this tool, she's unstoppable. <laughs> uh, the patients didn't really care that it was an AI rather than a human reading their images. They cared more about what their experience was going to be. And that's a general... Ex that ge general um, experience that I get from a lot of people working with human machine interactions is that the people don't they're not so super excited that it's a human if they uh, if the machine appears competent um, I think we've gotten used to AI being quite good at particular tasks and we're actually happy to outsource some of these to them but again if you build something for the real world you have to take into account the real world conditions and this feeds into papers like ImageNet v2 where you all of a sudden have a harder test set it feeds into topics like domain shift transfer learning domain adaptation and these are all research topics so i think problems like this can give rise to entirely new directions of research so if you're looking for a phd topic maybe this is something for you all right, thanks for watching this. This was my blabs about the story. I hope you enjoyed this uh, and these kind of new sections. Uh, it's a new thing I'm doing. If you like it, subscribe. If you didn't like it, leave a comment and bye-bye.